Welcome to Shaky Sports Journeys. Thank you for joining us. Um, interesting guest for you today. Um, I best be on my best behaviour first and foremost. Uh, this man is actually my uh, my direct line manager, my gaffer, some would say. So yeah, I need to I need to keep it all well behaved. Um, this gentleman um, is a, an ex professional footballer. Um, very interesting story. Uh, played for a, the, the most successful, or it was very much around the club for the most successful period um, in Wraith Rovers football history. Um, as well as that, you know, travelled down south, played for the likes of Millwall and some other clubs as well that we'll chat about. Graham Robertson, how are you, sir? I'm very well, Chris. And uh, yeah, you don't have to worry about being on your best behaviour with me, mate. I think you know that by now. So hopefully, looking forward to a good chat this morning. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, yes, no, it's uh, I'm always on my best behavior anyway, Graham. So, you know, it's uh, it's, uh, it, it, it's nothing new there, but yeah, no, I'm really cute, you know, got to got to know you quite quite recently. Um, and just really interesting story, and I want to I want to hear it today and you know, share it with other people as well. But I want you to kind of go back to your, your childhood, you know, where you were born, a bit about your family, where you grew up, please. Cool. Um, so, yeah, I'm from Fife originally, so um, I grew up, I was born in Edinburgh, but I grew up in uh, Glenrothes, so my mum and dad, when I was quite young, I was like primary one, moved to Glenrothes, which you may be aware if you have any knowledge of this in Scotland, is one of the new towns, so one of the towns with uh, lots of roundabouts, new towns in the 60s and 70s that was, um, and yeah, so we moved there in the early 80s. And I guess for my mum and dad, it was an opportunity. My dad worked in the electronics industry. My mum was an accountant and, and did finance and stuff as well. So it was kind of a new opportunity from that for them when we moved there. And for me, it was an opportunity to grow up in a place where, you know, lots of good friends. There was lots of opportunity to play sport nearby. Um, school days were good. I kind of did all right at school and um, kind of stuck in around that. But um I think it's probably safe to say that being in a town like Glenrothes and it being a new town, there was a real mix. I think you got a real sense of people from different backgrounds and different demographics and stuff that, that, that sort of fed into the high school I went to. So I think, um, you know, I just went to a comprehensive school. It was, it was called a community high school. Um, and uh, most of my opportunities in life came through sport, really. I happened, you know, I played in the school football team, school cricket team, interestingly enough, because then we had a cricket team as well, um, and rugby team and various other things. So I was always into sport, interested in sport, and, and kind of school was the bit that sat alongside that for me. So I enjoyed school and did well in terms of, you know, my O-levels and hires and stuff. But actually, sport was kind of that window where I saw an opportunity to potentially broaden my horizons and get other opportunities in life. So... Yeah, that was probably the, the early start for me. Any siblings, Graham? Yeah, so I've got a brother, I've got an older brother, um, and he was a very good footballer as well. Um, so we both we both kind of stuck in at football. Interestingly, the start of my, I guess, what sort of primed me for the opportunity to be a footballer, my, my, my brother's three and a half or four years older than me. And uh, back in the day, you, you started at under 12s at football, basically. So I started playing under 12s when I was eight because I played in my older brother's team and my dad took the team. Um, and then I basically had four years of playing under 12s before I actually played under 12s for my own age group. So by the time I actually started playing against people that were my own age, it felt quite easy compared to having played against guys that were four years older than you as well. And, and my brother was kind of my, uh, who I looked up to when I was growing up as, as, as the way we family and stuff as well. And I think the little nugget that probably gave me my best opportunity to make it as a footballer was my brother was left footed and I was naturally right footed. And because I really wanted to be like my big brother, I used to stand out in the back in the garage and kick the ball off the wall with my left foot for hours and hours and hours and end. And one of the things that was probably my, one of my biggest strengths or attributes when I became a footballer was I was very two-footed because of that. all that practice and hours of trying with my weaker foot meant that I was able to actually play quite well with both by the time I was an adult. So, yeah, I guess he was kind of an inspiration in that sense. Also as well, that three and a half, four years difference, um, quite a big difference at that age, size, physically-wise. So it sounds like just from listening to you there, you know, you probably had to tough up, toughen up well before your time. Um, but it's so that, that we, I mean, obviously we're going to go on to talk about the, where, where your football career went, but you obviously played at a, a very, very high level, professional level, um, and you need to be 
you need to be tough and you need to be able to to handle the pressures that come with that. So, you know, good grounding, I would say, that you got through there. Um, and your brother takes, uh, gets all credit for your left peg, mate. So big shout out yeah. to your big shout out to your big brother there. Indeed, indeed. And I think it also just the sort of, it's interesting even just, you know, it's easy to reflect back on this as, a, you know, an adult these days, but the, the mental side of it as well. I mean, you, you'll know having been involved in sport yourself, that a lot of it's down to, you know, how you think and your attitude and confidence and a lot of that that goes a long way to, you know, how far you go in, in terms of uh, professional sports, certainly. And, and and I think for me, because not only that sort of grounding, I've played with older, older kids when I was young, but also just we used to play, you know, we had football goals down at the park right next to where I lived and we were down there for hours every day and it was all, always older kids I was playing with. So I think I just kind of had to toughen up quite a lot from a young age because of that as well in terms of just the way they went about things and the physicality of it. And, you know, there was no referees when you had jackets down as goalposts. So, you know, you just had to kind of take the kicks and get on with it sort of thing. So I definitely think all of that kind of helped sort of, you know, give me the right sort of mental strength, I guess, as well for what, what I went on to do in terms of football in my career as well. And just before we start getting into that, your parents, you mentioned obviously Mr. Robertson was a manager of the uh, of the of the of the youth team. Um, yeah. What kind of he must have must have a big influence then on, on your football. Yeah, both both my mum and dad actually. My mum my mum was heavily involved with the teams right through the age groups with my brother and myself and my dad coached and ran ran the teams locally in, in Glenrothes and and uh, for for a number of years and with some of his friends as well that are still good friends, family friends to this day. Um and I think the biggest thing for me was just that that, you know, the all all the support and effort that goes around that. I think they, they you know, they, my mum washed the strips, she did all the like oranges for the half time, like just all the little bits that go around making a community club work and making Grassroots taxi football service, work. I'd imagine taxi service as well. All, all of that taking us around to all the different games. I mean, I don't think you know. Even at the start of my career with Wraith Rovers, played in a lot of reserve games as a youngster and, and youth games. My mum and dad were at all of them. My mum was a big, big supporter of me and followed me around everywhere as well. So that you know that that support mechanism around you and, and, and the family unit, you know, does does really help in, in in those scenarios too. I think. Absolutely, absolutely great to hear about the family. Um, Boys club football then, you would have been around just now, you know, 12 years old, played a little bit of boys club football myself, so I know kind of a little bit about how that, that world is, not to the extent you did, but what what was your kind of route from around 12 years old to 16? Who were you playing yeah. for and how did you progress? Um, so the team that my dad was involved with was a team called Glenrock Star Hearts, um, and uh, they were a reasonable size club in, in, in the five leagues, but certainly not one of the big guns. You had a few bigger teams like from Dunfermline and also going off the Strollers were a really big club at youth level when I played. So we were generally always trying to punch above our weight a bit to compete with these other teams. Um, but I really enjoyed that challenge. Again, I think, you know, I, I didn't necessarily play with a team that was winning every week or found it easy or was, you know, at the top of the leagues. And then obviously you've got that whole connection into Edinburgh and, and youth football and then the Scottish Cup and stuff where you would go through and play teams in Glasgow and Edinburgh and all of that. And that was almost like another level again when you were a team for five going over to Glasgow or Edinburgh. It was almost like going up another level too. So I really enjoyed those challenges. I, can, I particularly remember... There was there was a season there was a season I played that I must have been about twelve or thirteen years old, where because I was one of the better players on our team and because we were struggling a bit in terms of results, they decided to play me as a centre half for a season. So I played at the back, even though I was that you know more 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 prone to being a striker and scoring goals. And I still managed to end the season uh, top goal scorer with thirty odd goals for the team when I was playing centre half. So I think I didn't necessarily. Uh, take all of my defensive duties as seriously as I should have even in those days kind of thing. I was definitely one that was trying to charge forward and make a difference in the game and stuff. Um, and then from there, I got picked up reasonably early. I think I was 12 or 13 when I started training with Dundee United. So I trained with Dundee United as a kid. And they had they had a whole lot of stuff that they did in Fife. So they had sort of outreach from down from Dundee where they had coaches based in Fife that would take training sessions. Um, so I was with Dundee United, certainly from the age of about 12 till I was about 15. Um, and played in, you know, did normal a lot of training sessions with Dundee United, but also taken up to playing games up at up, up at up at Dundee United, either at the training ground or or occasionally actually in the stadium itself at Tannadice as well, which is always an interesting experience. And I think um, so. It was Jim Jim McLean era as well at Dundee United, who's obviously 
uh, well renowned for um, his quite uh, strict personality, let's say, in terms of how he how he approaches his players in the dressing room and stuff. And I certainly remember, you know, I must have been about 14 or 15 and played in the game at Tanadice and we didn't have the best of performances or results. I certainly remember getting the first exposure to a little bit of the, the hairdryer treatment, as it were, from Jim McLean when he came into the dressing room afterwards. But um, again, all, all part of sort of learning those different dynamics of sport and learning about different coaches and coaching style. We actually had, you know, the, the coach that took us at Dundee United um, in Fife was a really sort of nurturing coach and really, you know, helped you, enthused you, brought you along and stuff. And then to see the contrast of some of the approaches of, of other co coaches as well was something that, you know, again, you know, as someone who's been involved in sport I mean, I'm sure you've had different coaches over the years that take different approaches and styles, you'll, you'll be able to relate to that quite a bit. But I think it, you know, as a youngster, it starts to shape your thinking of, well, what works for me? What do I like in, out of a manager? What motivates me and gets me going and stuff as well? But you also take little traits of it from all aspects of the people that coach or manage you along the way as well. So, yeah, so I was at Dundee United till I was about 15 or so. And then that's when I got involved with Aith Rollers. So Jimmy Nicol, um, who is obviously... Had the chance, I, you had the chance, I believe, you could have technically signed with Dundee. Um, yeah, yeah. Yep. Um, I, I to do with the, was that something to do with the fact that a certain Wraith Rovers had just made history um, and come back into the Premier League? Yeah, so I mean, round, so bas basically round about... So when I was at the age of 15 or 16, Wraith Rovers showed an interest in me as well. And I was actually training... With, but at that time, you didn't necessarily need to commit to one club in the way that they have the pro youths and academy things these days. Um, so um, I was I was actually training with both for a period. And it was it was exactly that. So Jimmy Nicol had come in to Wraith Rovers at that point and they'd, just, um, they'd won the first division and got promoted into the Premier League. Um, he'd done it with a team full of... Young, young players, so there was the likes of Stevie Crawford, Jason Dare, Colin Cameron, um, a number of others that were coming through and getting an opportunity in the first team at Wraith at the time. And I think the defining moment for me, I think I had a training session when I was about, I must have been about 16, and I'd been training with Dundee United one night and had that sort of Jim McLean experience at a game that I'd had with them about the previous week. And then I went along to train with Wraith um, in their under-16 session, and it was actually Jimmy Nicol that came and took the session and he was just so hands-on with the youngsters and his approach was really about developing players and developing young players. And it was round about then that I thought, you know, I think my best opportunity to progress and potentially get first-team football and progress my career was going to be better served uh, at Race Rovers than, than Dundee United, despite the fact that they would have been perceived as probably a smaller club or, you know, more provincial club at that time. Now, just to ask, were Dundee, were Dundee United in the Premier at that point? So Dundee United would have been in the Premier League. They would have been, you know, top top four, top five, top six quite regularly at that time under under Jim McLean. And it was like so it was 1993, early 90s. So they're not so far off the back of the big success that Dundee United had in the 80s as well. Whereas for Wraith, you know, them being promoted in 1993 was a massive deal and was the first time they'd kind of gone up into that full time and, and had gone full time and were taking on young players in that way as well. But yeah, just the whole experience of how Jimmy Nicol approached things, the, the fact that there was very obviously a progression for young players um, at Wraith Rovers as well, because you could literally see it in the players that were playing in the first team. Again, harping back to sort of my brother, so, so the, the guys like the likes of uh, Colin Cameron and Stevie Crawford that had played against my brother in Fife Leagues as well. So I kind of knew of them as being some of the guys that were the better players from Fife. And to see that they'd made that very obvious progression from playing in the five leagues to almost going straight into the first team and, and, and helping them progress up the leagues, it gives you confidence that, you know, there's a pathway there for you and there's an opportunity there for you. And, and you can sort of try and mirror that, that journey that they've been on, albeit they were like two or three years older than me, obviously. So these must have been the things when you were a 16-year-old boy, sat at home around the dinner table, mum's involved in your football, dad's involved in your football, big brother. I can imagine it was a pretty... Pretty big conversation from the point of view of looking at all aspects of both opportunities, but definitely as a youngster, seeing that I think I can have a bigger impact and and, and progress quicker there. Plus, you got that experience of being around Jimmy Nicol and a, and a training session, and it's all just sounds like it's a, it's come together quite nicely for you. Yeah, it came it came together great, but interestingly, so that that whole you know I can that sitting around having the conversations with my parents and my brother and stuff. I can distinctly remember a conversation that I had with my mum, which involved, so 
obviously, uh, you know, you can leave school at 16, right? And you can, and at, at the, these days when, when I was joining the likes of Wraith or the offer for Dundee United, you, you essentially signed as a, as a YTS, so a, a youth training scheme footballer. Um, and uh, my my mum was quite adamant that whilst I, she was happy to support me in terms of that opportunity to become a footballer, that she wanted me to stay on at school for fifth year and do my hires first. Um, and she said, if you get certain grades in your hires, then I'll let you leave after fifth year and you can go and go and, go and pursue the football. So that you know, even at that point, and I think that's I think this is probably an important point to why I've ended up you know doing what I do now in terms of you know being involved with as a director at Volunteer Matters. Um, I always knew there was something else outside of football and that was drummed into me from quite a young age from my mum and dad that it was important to get your education, it was important to have something to fall back on, that the careers could potentially be shortened and all of that sort of stuff. Um, so I've got, yeah, I've definitely got my mum to thank for the fact that I stayed, I did stay on and do an extra year and at the time that was quite a big decision because a number of people that I'd been involved with at youth level were leaving and starting their first year full time as, as YTSs at Wraith. And I actually started a year later than everyone else. So I started when I was 17 rather than 16 because I stayed on and, and, and did my hires and thankfully got the grades that yeah. I said I would get Kassim to get, get, get that opportunity. Well, for anyone watching this or any parents watching this, um, massive shout out to, to Mrs. Robertson because that extra one year and the scale of your life was is really crucial. Um, and I bet there was a few that probably, you know, went early you know, yep. just in football, that's what I want to do, which you wanted to do as well, and probably look back now and think, probably should have given it another year. So, wise parenting, well done, Mrs. Robertson. Yep. And, uh, you know, I think it's probably stood you, as you've said, uh, you know, we'll talk at the, the end today about what more about what you're doing now, but it certainly has stood you in, in good stead. Yeah, that was a good decision at the time. Good to say, I bet at the time. I don't know if I thought, I don't know if I thought that at the time. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I was going to say, say that. I bet. I bet at the time you were thinking, Mum, just let me go and play football. There's nothing else that matters in life. But unfortunately in life, you know, like they say, there's not all any guarantees, nothing, you know, nothing, yeah. you know, there's a lot of luck that's involved in sport as well. Um, but yeah, we'll we'll talk about some of the other challenges that, that you faced and why this probably became really important later on as well. Um, three years, I believe, Graham, 93 to 96 yeah. at Wraith. Um Sounds like from reading up on your career that you were pretty much around the first team squad majority of that time. But it sounds like it wasn't a very easy first team squad to break into. Yeah, I mean, I think that's probably fair to say. I mean, anyone that, that's watching this that's a Wraith Rovers fan will know that the years between 93 and 96 were pretty much the most successful years the club has ever had and have gone kind of down in football and Kirkcaldy. Um, the season, so the season after I signed, so the season I signed when I was 17, it was the first season in, in, in the Premier League. So it was the first year YTS apprentice when they were playing in the Premier League. Um, as you can imagine, coming in in my first year, it was just about establishing myself in the youth teams and reserve teams and, and sort of trying to push for that, that to get in the squads. But the way that the, the brilliant thing that Jimmy Nicholl did even in those days was, so I mean, we're going back to the mid 90s, you only had two subs. And a goalie these days they have a bench full full of young young players and you know you have 17 18 players every every week playing football but in those days it was it was two two subs uh, and a goalie so what jimmy nickel used to do was still have a squad of like 17 or 18 players and your first stepping stone towards getting in the first team was to be in that 17 18 man squad and that meant that you went to the game you warmed up with the players you weren't necessarily stripped you were there as a reserve in case somebody took out on the day or got injured on, in the warm-up or whatever where you could step in and be on the bench. But what that meant was, even in my first year, um, a 17-year-old um, at Wraith, you were going to places like Ibrox and Parkhead and Tynecastle and, you know, being part of the squad, being in the dressing room, warming up, sitting on the bench for the game, all of that sort of stuff. You weren't necessarily named or stripped in the game, but that kind of, being able to soak up that kind of experience at such a, such a young age. And then at the same time, what they had, and they still had the Premier League Reserve League at that time as well. So you basically played all of the other clubs that were in the Premier League in a Reserve League. And at that time, they still played them in the stadium. So you would go and play at Ibrox and Parkhead against Celtic and Rangers with no fans there, which is quite an eerie experience sometimes in these massive stadiums. But all just incredible experiences, you know, at a young age. And then um, in the, the following year, my second season there was basically race race 
biggest season of all time. So they won, they won, they they got relegated from the Premier League. They then won the title again, but they also won the Coca Cola Cup against Celtic, which is kind of probably the most famous famous victory. And won it on penalties. And again, we were all. You know, as the young as the young players, we were all part of that squad and around it, and in the dressing room before and after the cup final. I remember being on the bus when we won the league with the first team and everything as well. And uh, there was a guy called David Sinclair, who I'm still good friends with to these these days. And um, and I remember him hanging out the top of the bus with the trophy and things like that. So just like you know, amazing memories that we were fortunate enough to, without actually playing in the games, still very much feel part of, because you were a club at that time, we probably had, they probably had a first team squad of about 15 or 16 players, and then a youth squad of about seven or eight. So, you know, it was a very close-knit group, and you, you all felt part of the success and part part of what had happened, and, and, and Jimmy Nicol in particular, who, you know, was an inspiration to everyone that was around Wraith at that time, and um, really made the younger players feel like they were part of that squad. And so much so that, um, you know, I think you're aware I was recently back at Starts Park for the first time in, in quite some time at, at a game. And I did a bit of stuff for Race TV and spoke to some, uh, you know, uh, some old colleagues that were there that were there from those days. And, and it's that kind of club where a number of people are still there 25 years later and still talk about those days and still talk about Jimmy Nicol and, and, and the influence he had. And actually, I'm in the process of, so it's, so 1993 was when there was a group of us all started as YTS with Mars at Wraith. And I'm in the process of organising a 30-year reunion for next well, year. So we're, hope, we're hoping to all uh, go and take in a game. And I think you said to me, the sign-ups were looking, the the sign looking decent. Yes, people are definitely interested enough for it. I've just got to coordinate a date that we can all do and get along to a game. So... Yeah, it'd be really exciting just to get back with, with, with some of the guys that we played with in that dressing room. So it, was a, it was a special time at the club, it really was. I think anyone that was associated with Wraith Rovers at that time still really looks back on that time really fondly. And to have been part of that, and then the consequences of, of course, of us beating Celtic in the Coca-Cola Cup final was that at the time, winning the League Cup meant you qualified for Europe. So Wraith Rovers then went into Europe the following year, um, and we were fortunate enough to... Um, get as far as drawing Bayern Munich in the in the UEFA Cup. So, you know, but I I I, I actually it was the earlier rounds of the European run that were most interesting for me. We played a team from the Faroe Islands and then we played a team from Iceland, and um, I was fortunate enough to be involved in the squads and be on the bench in both the away games for the the, the Faroe yeah. Islands game in Iceland as well, um, and then you know to get to a stage of a European competition where Wraith Rovers were drawn out the hat against Bayern Munich is just almost like, it's almost unbelievable really that it even happened, right? It was such an incredible It's mental experience. when you think about it, it's mental. Yeah. That it... And I don't think there's a Wraith Rovers fan in the world that doesn't have a picture of the scoreboard from Munich when Wraith Rovers were leading 1-0 at halftime over in Munich <laughs> in the second leg of that match where it said the old, the old Olympic Stadium from Munich with Bayern Munich nil, Wraith Rovers won on it is uh, a famous photograph that I noticed when I was back at Starts Park recently still still hangs on the walls uh, and as soon as you come into the stadium, uh, unsurprisingly so, because it was such an amazing moment. So yeah, again, you know, really fortunate to be around the club at such such an amazing time. But as you mentioned, it was difficult to break into a team that was having all of that success. You know, I mentioned some of the players that were there, Stevie Crawford, um, Colin Cameron are two that probably stand out as ones that went on to kind of really, you know, play for Scotland and, and have really successful careers from that team. But there was a, just such a great, great bunch of guys at the club and, yeah, had a great time, really. And, you know, it's interesting, Graham, being a Rangers fan, uh, you know, Wraith Rovers would not, wouldn't have predominantly been a team that I would have had a memory of but that period in particular, and the reason I remember even the Coca-Cola Cup win was obviously was huge. I remember the day. But um, my late brother used to go, used to attend a hospice in Fife called Rachel House. We used to go there as a family. And Jimmy Nicol just wandered in one Sunday afternoon and spent about four or five hours. I didn't really know who Jimmy Nicol was. You know, I was a young boy, but obviously I did. I really, when I got told Great Rovers Magic, and I followed from kind of there. And every time I would see him on screen, I'd be like, "Oh yeah, I've met, I've met that." But he was everything that you're talking about and what he built at Wraith Rovers came across in that kind of interaction that I had with the man that day. That he was just like not in a rush, you know, just giving everybody his time. Lovely guy, lovely man. Yeah, he was, he was, he was, he was, he was brilliant, and we got him. 
you know, he was 36, 37 when he came to Wraith. So he actually started as player manager. He played in the side that got promoted in the first year and played oh, some okay. of the games in the Premier League as well. And he, you know, he played for Man United and played for Rangers and played for Northern Ireland and World Cups. You know, he'd had a really like strong career as a, as, as a fullback uh, himself. So some of the stories he used to tell from the Man United games and, you know, being over in, uh, you know, he was in part of the 1982 squad when uh, Northern Ireland beat Spain in the World Cup in, in Spain. So, you know, you know, he's got some incredible memories and incredible players that he played with and stuff as well. And actually, interesting, I was just watching really recently, I don't know if you've seen any of the Sacked in the Morning podcasts that go out uh, nope, nope. That, that, that are run by Craig Levine and Amy Irons. So Jimmy Nicholl was a guest on that just recently and he was reminiscing about some of the times at, 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 at Wraith and at North an island and all of that stuff on that as well so it's nice to sort of see him still still chatting about those days so fondly and, and himself but he was su- he was such an inspiration on that on that squad and certainly on me as a, as a, as a young a young man as well in terms of just his 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 attitude towards people the way he gave his time really generously that you you know you just demonstrated by you talk, talking about your own example he was always someone who would stop and say hello and take time with people and, and take time with you as an individual to understand you and, and, and understand what motivates you and all of that stuff as well. And I think that, again, that's something that you just sort of soak up and learn and you take into other things that you do. You know, I'm obviously I'm a leader and a manager in, in, in my, my role currently and there's loads of stuff that I picked up from my football career that's 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 gone on to, you know, influence how I've been as a person and, and, and try and be with others as well. Yeah, listening to you, um, it, it sounds like that decision you made, although at that age you were probably, you know, choking to just get on the park, you were still playing football, as you said, at a pretty high standard because you were playing against all the Premier Clubs at a reserve level. You were pretty damn successful. Was it, was it 22 goals in 18 games or 18 goals in 22 games? Uh, what, I'll uh, get that. It was, 20, it was 22 and 18 in the reserve league season that yeah, I had. So that was, that yeah, was pretty, yeah. pretty nice. That was pretty so, nice. You, so it wasn't like you weren't, you were red, you were just, it was such a good team. You know, not that you weren't good enough, good enough, but you were, you're obviously very young. But that experience, those three years, is like gold dust. Like you've yeah. seen success, you were around big nights, you were experiencing a crowd, you know, it would set you up. It's like a, you know, and it was an apprenticeship, you know, and it really is. It's like it's like going into a, a car mechanic and being around and getting stuck right in. You were getting all of that um, and this great mentorship and management leadership you were getting from Jimmy Nichol. And he mu- you must have made an impression on him as well because I believe he goes down south and then at the age of 19, you know, you're getting your pack, you're, you're you're packing your bags and you know waving waving bye to mum and dad and and your big brother and your mates and you know Jimmy's asked you to come down to Millwall. Yeah. So so yeah, I think it's reasonably well documented that Jimmy Nichol left Wraith on the back of all of that success and 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 took it as an opportunity to go and try his, try his luck down south and he he landed the Millwall job um, and within you know a few months of going down there he. I think he went midway through a season and then at the end of that season, he, he, he obviously wanted to look to sign some players that he knew and bring in some of his own players as you do, as most managers do when they go, go to a new club. So he, he actually signed four Scottish players and then I was the fifth one that went down under the radar basically because him. So he, he, he publicly signed um, Stevie Crawford, Davy Sinclair, Jason Dare and a young lad called Paul Hartley you've probably heard of and know yep, of as well yep. and on to play for Harps and Celtic in Scotland as well um, so he signed the four of them at the start of the 1996 season and then round about that point I was just in conversations with Wraith Rovers about potentially whether I was going to have a new contract with them or not and the, the opportunity arose to, to maybe have a look at moving down down south myself and, and, and I actually went on a, a very quick trial so I was down there for a couple of weeks um, on this trial period where I was training with Millwall and uh, played in a couple of, a couple of games as well just to get you know a feel for the club and a feel for the setup and everything like that and uh, I think I was the, the final trial game I had I was fortunate enough to score uh, probably the best hat trick I've scored in my entire career and it was a classic I scored one with my right foot one with my left foot and one with my head so it was the perfect hat trick as well because it included a, a few different types of goals and um, and it was when I came off the pitch from that game that, that Jimmy Nichol just sort of came over at me and said look you know 
we, I was looking to get you a contract offer anyway, but the performance you've just put in there, our chairman was at the game. So I think your negotiations are going to be easier than they might have been before before today's performance. So I happened to have a really good performance in that game. And I'll just tell you a very quick story because it's just, it's just uh, kind of sums up how the football and world can work sometimes. So, so, that, so that next day, pulled into the stadium and pulled in to meet with Jimmy Nicol and the chairman. And my dad was down for a couple of days because he knew I was coming towards the end of the trial as well. So I, I was 19, right? I didn't have a football agent. I didn't have any of that nonsense around me or anything. I was a young guy that, you know, was just looking to make his way in, in the game sort of thing. So I sat down with my dad outside the uh, before we've just had like 20 minutes before we went into the meeting with 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 Jimmy Nicol and the chairman in Millwall. And my dad's like, right, just let me handle what's going on with the negotiations and stuff. He says, like, we, and, and we'd come up with an agreement of this is like, this is our lowest we would take, this is a medium for us, and this is kind of what would be we would consider really good. And we'd kind of had some numbers in mind and lengthy contract in mind and all of that sort of stuff. But my dad's like, don't worry about it, I'll handle the negotiations, I do this in my day job and all that kind of stuff, right? So we go in <laughs> and we sit down in front of Jimmy Nicol and, and the Millwall uh, chairman, and the offer that they give us is bigger than our highest best that we thought we were going to get right so my dad just looks at me and goes yeah we should probably just sign it like that and I like kick him under the table and I'm a bit like you know I thought we said we were going to negotiate we're not going to just take the first thing that they offered and stuff and anyway after a wee bit of back and forth and a wee bit and a wee bit of laugh because I obviously knew Jimmy Nicol quite well and um, they um, I managed and this is probably the start of me being good at negotiations because as you know I do business development for my job these days but I managed to get them to throw in um, a six month um, moving package so sort of to get me moved down into London and so six months in a new flat and they got me a car and stuff as well so I got them to add a couple of different things onto the deal that other white boys might not have got um, but did, you have a word, did you have a word with Mr. Robertson when you walked out and said, "Dad, uh, we, we, we all we just uh, we had a laugh about it." I mean, ultimately, you know, the, you know, the deal as a nineteen-year-old, and this is really interesting thing. So, as a nineteen-year-old, I signed a four-year contract for Millwall that was probably with add-ons and everything else involved, and it worth about a quarter of a million pound as a nineteen-year-old. So, you know, definitely came out of that negotiation quite well and got uh, you know on, on a considerably bigger deal than I would ever have been on in Scottish football at that age and stuff as well. But it's just really interesting to think there's levels to this thing, right? At that time, Millwall would have been and had just been relegated to what is the equivalent of uh, League One, basically. Um, so, you know, you had the Championship above that and then the Premier League above that as well. And I think this is where I've always kind of looked back on my football career and think I was really fortunate in the way it panned out for me because... I got to play at a level and 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 be paid the kind of money that meant that I was able to enjoy some of the fruits of being a footballer and then enjoy and, and enjoy you know some of that financial security that came with it. But I never played at a level where it was silly money, and I never played at a level where I was famous. And I think you know, all of the trappings that potentially come around that and everything, and you see a lot of these young guys that are exposed and, and put into you know, high profile teams at a very young age and, and, and some of it can spiral in the wrong direction. So I guess I kind of got, I kind of feel like I got to live the best of both worlds. I got to move to London as a 19 year old on a really, for a really good club and, and be in a really successful space, but I didn't, it didn't have all the trappings that go with all the other stuff around it. So yeah, I think I was lucky in that sense. I know you mentioned quite a few of the other Scottish players were heading down there as well. So what was the whole experience like of now, where were you living? Who are you living with? And, you know, what was your kind of, you know, obviously you're training hard and you're, you're on game days, but, I mean, who, what did you do in your downtime? Did you have some mates that you made down there? It was the first few months were mad. The first few months that we were there, uh, they basically just bought a big house for all the Scottish players and there was like four or five, the four of them were living together. I had a separate flat. I, I'd got a flat and I was actually living next to two, Australia. there was two young Australian guys um, at Millwall at the time, one called Lucas Neal, who went on to play with like Blackburn and West Ham and stuff in the Premier League. And then the other young Australian guy was a guy called Tim Cahill, who's obviously, you know, a bit of an Aussie legend and he's you know, yeah. been quite a bit around the Australian Socceroos team for the World Cup recently. I've seen he's there as an ambassador on their behalf at the moment. So so we had three flats in this block that were basically just three flats with doors next to each other. So I was basically rooming with the, the, two, Auss the two Aussie guys. And then there was another house where 
the rabble was that that was the four other Scottish guys uh, all living together for the first six months or so as well. And um, so, I mean, I guess from that perspective, uh, the beauty of being with a football club is, and the fact that I was going down and, and a number of players have gone down from Scotland at the same time, is you almost had that ready, ready-made sort of family around you or friends to support you around you and stuff as well. Because it was a big change. I mean, I was 19. I've been, you know, been living with mum and dad and playing for the local team in Kirkcaldy and, you know, essentially, you know, had all of that support in my family and everything else around me. And then to move to London from going office at that age, massive, massive life change, massive lifestyle change. But I think, again, a few things that helped make it a success. Mill- Millwall were a great, great community club, you know, despite some of the reputation that goes around the club in terms of the fans and some of the, the behaviour, especially, you know, in the late 80s and 90s and stuff as well. Um, they were actually a really big community club and and, and uh, they had that sort of family around them, both at the training ground and at the club itself. So you felt part of something when you were there. But I think also just having that network of people that were, I mean, we were all young footballers. I mean, the age range was probably, Tim Cale would probably have been the youngest at 17, right up to, I mean, Davy Sinclair was seen like our father figure and he was probably 24 at the time, which when you think about now, he's still very, very young, you know, but he was probably the oldest one in that group of us that all sort of hung about together sort of thing. So, um, yeah, at least you had other people going through that same experience or, or, or around you to kind of support you and, and help you through it sort of thing. Push you as well, I'd imagine, at training, uh, you know, I mean, as if you know, once training finishes, it doesn't mean as a as a footballer at that level, especially when you're trying to break in. You know, you need to put the extra hours in. So to have these kind of inspiring people, players that want to inspire to play at the top level as well, must have always kept you kept you going. Yeah, well, it, it, it definitely did. And Jimmy Nicol was great with that. He even when so if I look back, so he always looked for a blend of youth and experience, right? So he always had at the heart of it, he had these young, hungry players in his squads. But if I look back, even at the time at Wraith and at the time that I was at Millwall, so during the time at Wraith, he brought in people like David Neri, came in towards the end of his career, who was next Scotland and Dundee United legend, basically, and he came in and played his last sort of couple of years at Wraith. Obviously, Jimmy Nicol himself was still playing in those days at Wraith as well and bringing all his experience from Man United and Northern Ireland as well. And then when we were at Millwall during during my period there, we had players like Kenny Sampson, who's really famous left back for England, came and trained and played with us for the last couple of years of his career. Ray Wilkins came and played for about six months at, at Millwall as well whilst I was there. So, you know, Jimmy Nick was always really good at finding that balance between having a young, hungry squad, but also bringing in experienced pros around them to kind of, I guess, just give you all their experience, talk to you about how to play. Generally tended to be the players that he brought in were ones that, um, you know, were exemplary on the training field in terms of their attitude and in terms of how they went about things. And if you're a if you're a 19, 20-year-old footballer and you're looking at someone like Ray Wilkins staying out and doing extra passing at the end of a tra- training session so he can still work on the thing that he was renowned for being amazing at, which was his long long ball passing, um, that certainly gives you inspiration to go that extra yard and do a bit more yourself as well, you know, to improve your game all the time too. So I think, yeah, he was, he was quite clever in how he went about sort of positioning that stuff within the squads. Really good balance, good mix. Um you know, I, I like it. I like it because I think bringing youth through is it's the future. You got to plan. You have to have the you know players coming through. But to have the experience is just you know it's it's a great it's a great it's a great mix to have. Um, so tell me about your time down there then, performance wise on the pitch. You know some of the standout moments that you had, um, and how, I think you were down there in total probably about what two 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 and about three almost three years. Yeah, it was close close on three years. Um, and uh like four different managers in those three years. So I think first thing to highlight is just, you know, the way way sport can be and the way football can be in particular. Um, so Jimmy Nicol got sacked six months into me being there. The majority of the rest of the Scottish guys left within the first year and went back up to Scotland. So in the end, I was the only one that was still there from the ones that he'd signed and brought in. We had four different managers in the three years that I was there. It was a period of, you were, your face fitted, then it didn't, then it did, then it didn't again, sort of thing. But I guess a couple of highlights um, for me during that period. I mean, actually, um, my debut for Millwall was at this, still goes down as an absolute highlight for me. And, and the, so I, I talked to you about that story about having signed um, 
you know the story with the chairman and stuff like that so the next next day i went into training after that after having having signed the papers and i was due to go back up to scotland because i'd I'd literally come down with a bag for a couple of weeks right and now i actually had to move my life so i was due to go back up to scotland uh, uh, that weekend and um, so i went in on the wednesday morning and i was and i was just in at training and, and jimmy nickel had an assistant called martin harvey who'd been up with him at race so he knew me quite well and he, he, he was at millwall as well and I was just training away with, I can't remember, it would be in the youth team or reserve team or whatever. And he comes running over to me and he's like, what are you doing here? And I was like, do I'm training? <laughs> and he went, he says, you know, you're in the squad for tonight. And I was like, what's tonight? And he says, we're playing Liverpool at the Den and you're in the squad. So I would suggest you stop training, go and get yourself a bite to eat and have a wee rest for the afternoon and then get yourself along to the, the game for the night. So they put me straight in the squad for that the, the, the first game. And, and so I was on the bench against Liverpool and it was the Liverpool team that had just the, the previous game they played to this preseason friendly was the cup final where they'd lost to Man United, where they all wore the cream suits before the game. They quite that. famously wore those cream suits at Wembley, and it was the Spice Boys team. It had you know, Jamie Berger, Berger, and players like that. Yeah, Jamie, Jamie, Jamie Redknapp, Robbie Fowler, Stan Collymore, you know, Steve McManaman, that sort of Liverpool era of team. So, yeah. Quite, a, quite an incredible team and uh, so yeah anyway so I, I went along and on and, and the evening the game and was on the bench I hadn't even met some of the Millwall first team players so I was literally introducing them to myself before the game in the changing room kind of thing and I was on the bench and uh, I got on for the last half hour of that game and I always remember it just stood out with me so I not I said to you I was normally a striker so I was you know I either played sort of striker or in the hole that was kind of my preferred position as a as, as a player and Jimmy Nickel called me over and I went on for like the last 25 minutes, half an hour or whatever. Um, and he just put me on in centre midfield and he just said, just go and enjoy it. He just says, just go and enjoy it and go and have a run at them and enjoy yourself and, you know, see if you can get us a goal kind of thing or whatever was his last one. And I remember turning him and went and just saying, who am I marking? And he went, number 10. And I went, who's number 10? And he went, John Barnes. And I went, all right. <laughs> and I just kind of ran on. And went for it sort of thing so i think that was a real moment where i was kind of like this is a whole oh, player, other, yes. oh, this player. is a whole other level right to where what even you know even with the success that they had in scotland and stuff that some of the players and some of the opportunities that i got when i was playing at millwall just just incredible so yeah that was that was that was a real real standout moment for me as well but well, what was that let's speak quickly about that 30 minutes any in particular moments that you're about part I think of the I did have a little run where I took a couple of players on and hit a shot and the goalie tipped it over the bar. We did draw 0-0 nice. in the game, so it was like a pretty close tight game. There was about, you know, it was pretty much a full house at Millwall, so there was about 20-odd thousand at it and stuff as well. So, yeah, really really enjoyable experience and, and uh, yeah, it became a little, because I did okay, well, did quite well in the game when I came on, there was a little focal point in the press afterwards sort of saying this is the new sign-in and obviously you seen him last night and Jimmy Nick talked about me a bit and stuff after the game and saying that's what she'd hopefully bring to the squad and everything. Um, but then it was a bit of a roller coaster ride from, from then on in with the different managers and all of that sort of stuff. Highlights again, so we had Billy Bonds come in as a manager for a year when I was at Millwall and he was ex-West Ham and, you know, a big, big legend uh, in London and the South East. And... Uh, he, he really quite liked me and, and I was involved in quite a few squads around about the time that he was there. Um, but Millwall just never quite found success in the period that I was there. Um, and then rather frustratingly, not long after I left, they actually got to the FA Cup final and played against Man United with the crux of the squad that I'd been involved in. So the likes of you know Tim Cahill and a few others that I'd played with were all still there at that time. Um, and they got to the FA Cup final and played against a Man United team with a certain young Cristiano Ronaldo in the side as well. So I missed out on that opportunity by about 18 months, unfortunately, in my time that I was at Millwall. But I mean, overall, just, you know, it was an amazing experience and, and, and living, you know, living in London even as well, just 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 getting to experience that as a, a, a young age. I just loved it. It was great. It was a great time in my life. So you leave... You leave um, leave Millwall. If I'm right in saying, come back for a stint at Wraith. Yep. So I joined. I left. I left Millwall. I think it was like late '98, maybe starting '99, something like that. And then uh, uh, Jimmy Nickel was back at Wraith, unbelievably at that time. So you know, signed me for a third time. So he clearly, definitely liked me in some way, shape, or form. 
Um, so went back and, and more than played. liked you, more than liked you. Took yep. you down south and then he brought you back brought, to the brought, you, brought, clearly, brought, you clearly impressed. Brought brought him, brought me back again and uh, oh, that was that was probably one of the more frustrating. This is when injuries start to come in and I know we, you know we've spoken about you know that before in terms of how it impact that it can have on careers and stuff. But uh, so I came back and started in Wraith's first team, went went straight into first team and was doing quite well. Paul Hartley was actually there at the time as well, but he was back at Wraith from my wall as well. So there was a few connections and players that I knew from the time I'd been there before as well. Um, and I had a run of about 10 or 11 games in the first team at the start of that season. And then for whatever reason, I'd been on the bench in one of the games on the Saturday and there was a reserve team game on the Monday night at, up at Forfar. And because I hadn't played on the Saturday and because I was keen to get back in the side, I sort of said to Jimmy Nick, look, I'd really like to go and play in that reserve game, just get, get 90 minutes in and, you know, just try to show keenness, right? And keenness to get back in the squad and all of that sort of stuff. And it wasn't unusual for the guys that had been on the bench to play in the reserve games on the Monday night. It was quite normal for them as well. But the frustrating thing is I volunteered. So he hadn't put me in the reserve squad. He wanted to keep me in the first team squad, but I volunteered saying, no, I want to go and play because it would just be good to get another 90 minutes and keep myself picking over. And of course, lo and behold, cold, frosty night up in Forfar on a uh, Monday night, and I went over on my ankle, and and I ended up having an ankle injury. I was out for about six months or so with that ankle injury, and then for various different reasons, didn't get back into the Ray first team at that point. Um, so then I ended up at East Fife um, the following season, and had about eighteen months to two years at East Fife, um, and that was a guy. Uh, called Stevie Kirk, who had also played with me at Wraith under, under some of the time that I'd been there, but he was player manager at, at East Fife at that point. Um, so he took me in to go and play at East Fife and, yeah, had a couple of seasons playing there where I actually played, you know, the full seasons in the first team, scored quite a few goals, you know, quite enjoyed my times there. Um, unfortunately, the last game of the season uh, for East Fife, that, that season we needed to win at Dumbarton a ground called Boghead, the old Dumbarton ground. And unfortunately for us, we happened to land playing Dumbarton on the last game of the season, needing to win, when it was the last ever game at Boghead. So it was the last ever game going to be played there. So as you can imagine, their fans turned out in extreme numbers and they were very keen, the players were very keen to get a win for Dumbarton on the last game that they ever played at Boghead. And unfortunately, we lost 2-1 and didn't get promoted that year. And then the usual stuff that happens in football, changing manager you know, changes stuff. And, and actually, for life for me, I ended up uh, moving back down to London again at that point. Um, uh, and I ended up playing non-league down in London because I enjoyed my time so much down in London that uh, a couple of different things in life took me back down there. Um, and I actually ended up playing three or four years sort of semi-pro in the sort of conference and what would be called the you know, the Isman Premier or something these days. The one below the, the pyramid, basically, in England and playing, playing for two or three years down there. And that was when I started to sort of fall back on some of the stuff we spoke about at the start of this in terms of, um, you know, I, so I studied then. So I went to uni. When I went back down to London, I studied and got a degree in marketing and advertising um, and then started to look at what life might look like beyond football. Um, and... Uh, yeah, so when I was about 28, 29, I got a bad knee injury when I was playing non-league down south, and that was pretty much the end of football for me. It was kind of like, um, it was a difficult knee injury to get back from anyway, and at the stage I was in my life and career, and when I was still was playing semi-pro and steady pro, it just it just became a really tough injury to come back from. Um, so that's when I started to look at what life might look like outside of football. How did you feel at that point? Pretty young. Obviously, football's been your life. Um that must have been a bit, bit tough to deal with. It was definitely tough. I think looking back um, when I was 20, 28, 29, when I got the knee injury, I think because of because I'd been doing my degree, so I did my degree in market and advertising, because I was by that stage I was semi-pro, so I had started to do a little bit of, you know, I had a job in a pub or things like that. So I started to do stuff to supplement my income because obviously at semi-pro the income's not enough to sustain especially, you know, life, life in London with the costs that are involved down there and stuff as well. So I'd, I'd begin to have that bit of balance between I would train on a Tuesday and Thursday night, I would play at the weekend, I would I had a job, you know, that worked in the pub a few nights in between, I was doing my uni. So it probably wasn't as hard a transition for me in the sense that I began to make that transition anyway, in terms of having other things in my life. I think for a lot of 
sportsman, I think for a lot of footballers, you know, if they get a bad injury or they get something that, that means that their career has to stop, it can be quite like, oh my God, what am I actually going to do? And they've not got anything else to fall back on. And again, this sort of all circles around to where, you know, I have to give thanks to my parents again for the fact, you know, they, the fact I was able to do a degree was because I'd stayed on that extra year at school and got my hires and had the qualifications to go and do a degree in the first place. Um, so it was, def- it was definitely tough. I definitely, there was a period I didn't play football at all. I think in my early 30s for about three or four years, I didn't, I wasn't involved in football, didn't kick a ball, just kind of stepped away from it completely. Um, and I think retrospectively looking back and at that point, I got a full-time job. So I was working in marketing and advertising and stuff at that stage in London on the back of my degree. And uh, yeah, I think it's probably easy to say that that was a period now where I was probably transitioning into having a real job, you know, and working 95 and doing all the things that the majority, you know, I'd been so fortunate to get paid to do something I loved from such a young age to then be into that grind of the Monday to Friday, the 95, the everything else that goes around that life. I think it was definitely, you know, I think looking back reflectively now, it was definitely quite a challenge in two or three years, probably even just mental health wise and stuff like that as well. You know, I think I was definitely, definitely drank a lot then more so than I ever have. Um, and actually now, interestingly, so what age am I now? I'm 46 now. Um, I actually stopped. Uh, so I don't drink alcohol at all anymore, and I haven't done for nearly 10 years now. Well, um, part well, of that... Even that reflects on that period where it was a lowest point in your life, probably. Yeah, definitely. You know, I think it's easy to say that in hindsight now, but yeah, I think definitely it was a period where you know I was probably drinking a wee bit too much. I was adjusting to a different sort of style of life outside of football. And I was probably a wee bit depressed, if I'm honest. Um, and then, but I managed to kind of work my way out of that, and I managed to sort of make some lifestyle changes. And one of them is, yeah, that I, you know, I don't, I don't drink at all uh, anymore. Um, and I think that's something that's been a really positive thing on, on, on my life and, and, and stuff as well. And, and if, any, if anything, I maybe wish I'd discovered that a bit younger as well, because uh, you know, I think my life's much more balanced, and what you know, a lot of positive things have happened in my life since I. I, I made a sort of lifestyle choice to stop drinking you've alcohol. Got, you've got, uh, you've got, you've got three young boys. I must, uh, you know, that that was that. You, every time I speak to you, when it comes to Friday, you know, you've got an itinerary plan for the weekend. Sunday mornings, you're up early with the boys. You know, yeah. these are things that probably hamper you a little bit if you have still a lot of drink. You know, quite a bit of drinking in your lifestyle. So that must have had a massive impact in your fatherhood. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely had. And it was, you know, it wasn't the only reason for me deciding to stop drinking, but it was definitely part of those choices. And when I was saying it must be nearly 10 years now, I know that because my eldest son's about to be 10 and it was pretty much around when he was born that I stopped, that I, that I stopped drinking at all, basically. Although I'd been making adjustments to it for a few years prior to that anyway, sort of thing. Um, but yeah, they're, they're, they're a huge part of my life. And a big part of that decision as well was I just, I, I wanted to be present in, in my kid's life. And, and, and you, know, got, you know, as you mentioned, I've got three, three young boys. So one of, them's, one of them's about to be 10 and the other two are seven and five. And they, you know, the eldest in particular is massively into football and massively into sport. And unsurprisingly through that, I've, you know, I've become involved. I'm a coach for the local team at, here in Haddington where I live and I coach his AIDS group and stuff. And I've taken loads of joy out of kind of, taking some of the stuff that I learned through football and trying to put that back in through the, the, the community club and stuff as well. But yeah, um, you know, those sort of, that, that, that adjustment period, going back to, you know, what we were talking about before, that period of stopping playing football, adjusting to having a real job and adjusting to different things in my life. I think that's a hard time for, for anyone that's, that, that's been a sports, sports person. But I think what got me through that was, there was two or three different bits. One, I'd had a bit of an, you know, I'd done the education stuff, I'd got a degree, so I had a focus and I had something that I wanted, you know, a bit of drive of what I wanted to do outside of football. I think sometimes the challenge is people just don't know, even know what they want to do. Um, two, just really good network of friends, family and everyone else around me supporting me through that as well. And I think that's really important to get you through those sort of more difficult periods in your life and talking about it and speaking to people about it and getting advice and all of that sort of stuff. And then the third thing, which actually probably brings it full circle into what I do in my day job now today is um, I'd always been really interested in sort of community and giving back and all of that sort of stuff. So to bring it right back to the start, when I I moved to Millwall when I was 19, 
um, because of, again, I touched on this earlier, some of the reputation that Millwall has for its fans and all of that sort of stuff. They were really heavily involved as a community club in, in South East London. And one of the things that I did while I was at Millwall was I, I, I quite regularly volunteered to be one of the players that would go and do visits into schools or go and you know visit people in hospital or, do, or whatever it was that they were doing around the club that was the community aspect of the club. And it really gave me a flavour for what it meant to volunteer, not only for what people got out of the fact that you, you, know, you were a young footballer coming into their school or coming into the hospital to visit them or all of that sort of stuff, but actually making me recognise what I got out of it as a person and what it felt like and, and, and what you know, skills I developed through doing, through doing those sort of things as well. So I can sort of pin back the moment because, I mean, as you as you know now, because I'm, I'm a director of a, a charity called Volunteering Matters, which is all about, you know, helping people um, make a difference in their communities through the power of volunteering. I can kind of fully trace back full circle to where that started for me and where the inspiration to sort of work in the third sector and to do something that feels like it makes a difference um, really came from. And it definitely was. Um, through my, my time, you know, volunteering in the community when I was at Millwall, basically. Yeah, I can relate to you as well, Graham. In some ways, you know, going to South Africa as a 17, 18 year old to play cricket and getting to go to, you know, going and visiting a township and, you know, being around and seeing the poverty that, that exists and wanted to do something active, whether it's play a game of cricket with them or do something just to give back. Uh, but it's interesting that you had a passion for that and it has come full circle, uh, interesting that I've ended up uh, in this space as well, and it is, it's such a it's such a pow powerful work that what volunteering matters do, um, and you see the impact that it has in communities throughout um, the UK, um, so, you know, I, you strike me as somebody now in life who's pretty happy, pretty content, pretty, um, you know, appreciative of 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 what you're able to do on a daily basis, but also that network around you, the three boys. You're but you haven't mentioned this yet. Big Hearts fans, um. So you know, I know you 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 and the boys are down Tyne Castle often, um. And and then part of the boys' football is football something you know. I, I the way you talk, your leadership skills, everything. You know. I know volunteering matters don't want to lose you, but I mean, one day, one day, maybe in future, if somebody came knocking and said, Graham, you're interested in coming back in and doing a bit of managing in football? I mean, I think you would have so much to offer. It is, it's, it's an interesting one. I mean, it's definitely something that's that's always there with you when you've been involved in sport and you know that yourself with the cricket. And I know you've, you're involved in coaching and playing still yourself and things like that as well. It never le leaves you, right? And it's definitely something that's been sparked again through my involvement with the community club at, at, at Haddington. Obviously, I'm, I'm, it's, it's, I love teaching the young kids, right? I had them since they were five. They're about they're all about nine years old now, and just seeing them going through that journey of development and growing and all of that sort of stuff. We've got about 25, 30 kids that come along regularly to our, our, our club at that age level. But it has sparked a little something in me in the visit back to Race Rovers recently where I've started to think maybe there's something more in that sort of sport direction for me in, 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 in the long term. I mean, I'd have to do all of the, the stuff, the UEFA licenses and the, the training and all of that, but I don't think that would be something that would be necessarily a barrier to me, me making that journey. I think that's something I could look to do. And I, and I take inspiration a little bit. It's interesting some of the, the people that I've mentioned uh, uh, during my journey, but Paul Hartley's been... You know, a manager of various clubs in Scotland and had plenty of success since he was a player and gone into management. Stevie Crawford's currently assistant manager at Dundee United and has been a manager himself at Dunfermline East Fife. He was assistant manager at Hearts under Robbie Nielsen for a while. The current assistant manager under Robbie Nielsen right now is a guy called Gordy Forrest, who is one of the people that started as a YTS with me at Wraith in 1993 and we're still in touch with and we'll be coming on to the reunion at Wraith in a few months' time. So I've got all these people and that were influences on my life, but were also friends through that journey and stuff as well, that are still involved in their own way. Colin Cameron's recently been made the assistant manager again at Wraith Rovers as well. So, you know, loads of these guys that are involved in football and that are coaching and that are doing it at, at a decent level that gives you that wee bit of inspiration again, just to sort of think, well, maybe that could be me or maybe I could do that in the future. Um, but who knows? I love what I do at the moment. You know, I think you, you're very aware. I'm really passionate about volunteering matters work and, and what we do in communities and, and the difference that we make. I've been involved now in the charity sector for about 12 years um, and worked in various different roles at various different organisations. And I really, 
you know, I think I spoke a lot about the fact that I was very fortunate to get to do something I love and get paid for it when I was a footballer. And I think I've managed now, you know, to come full circle and I do something that I love. It's not football, but, you know, I do something that I love as my job still to this day. And I think um, my biggest learning with all of that in life is you've got to, it doesn't just happen, right? You've got to go out and kind of make these things happen. And I think, again, we talked about that sort of support network around me. And But a lot of what I have in terms of drive or looking to achieve or, or looking to be as successful as I can, both for myself, but for my family and, and, and to provide and all of that sort of stuff comes from what you learn from being a footballer and all that mental toughness and, and you know, having to challenge yourself and give yourself goals and all, and, and all of the, you know, one of the, th one of the hardest things about being a footballer is you move from contract to contract, right? You've only ever got a job for a year or two years or whatever it happens to be in terms of that contract that you've signed. So you're constantly having to prove yourself and you're constantly having to push yourself and give yourself goals to make yourself a success. And I think that's been really helpful in my transition into, you know, working in the role that I do in a leadership role now across volunteering matters is hopefully I can kind of take bits of that and apply it to what we do in our day-to-day -day jobs and try and inspire people to try and be the best versions of themselves and be a success as well. Yeah, because when we're not, when we're not talking work, which by the way is more often than not great to our employers watching, you know, we do spend most of our time talking about the work stuff, but we also share, you know, Pretty similar. When I remember the first time that I met you and I got talking to you, we have a very similar kind of background. I went to London when I was 17 at playing cricket professionally. You went from football. Um, you know, I've went through that kind of transition period of coming out and playing at the top level and then having to kind of go into the big bad world. I didn't listen so much to my mum and chose <laughs> not to maybe put in that extra grind um in school. And you know, cricket was the be all be all and end all. Um, so, you know, but it just proves that even when you do have it, even when you do have something behind you that did allow you to go into university, it's still a big gap in your life. It's still difficult to deal with that period of time that's like, I've lost, I've, this has just been part of my life. It's just everything to me. Um, so, you know, it's no surprise that happens. But I think it's important now that people like yourself and other sport, sporting people talk about this because I think the support, because we don't want to go through Sports people shouldn't have to go through always that two, three year period where it's like mental health struggle. They should have like a, a plan in place to support that. I think it's getting better, but I think there's still room to get even even more better. Um, but from talking to you, um, having gone through something tough in my life recently, I've got to experience, you know, having you as a manager and having you as a mentor and, you know, you've got so much to offer. Um, and then with the, with the mix that you have with your football knowledge, you know, I think you could be, you could be, you could be fantastic. So, not saying anything right now, but never, you can never say never in life. Um, but if you were to get the opportunity, I'm sure Graham, one day, in two or three, four years time, maybe to manage a club in you know Scottish football, I think it would be a kind of dream come true and a kind of so you know twilight of your working career to kind of have maybe ten years of being a manager. I'd love to see it. Yeah, um, I'm conscious that. Uh... Both of our bosses and my CEO might see this as well. So I'm going to say I'm quite committed to volunteering matters for now, but it is something I might pursue in the, the longer term, because I'm for sure. And I think I'll, I'll, I'll probably end it on a wee note that ties it all together as well in terms of, uh, I think I maybe mentioned this to you when we were going to have this chat, that I, there was a, I got a programme given to me when I was at Wraith Rovers recently that had my profile from when I was 17. As a young, You know how they do the profiles in the yep. programme. And at the end of it, I said that they said, what's your biggest ambition in football? And I said to play for Scotland at a World Cup finals. So uh, I think where I'm at at the moment is I'll maybe leave this one with the lingering thought of maybe my biggest ambition now is to be a manager of Scotland at a World Cup finals because he lead, lead, lead the country to that. And we can see if I can try and achieve that in the next... 20 or 25 years might be a slightly unrealistic goal but you know That's if you don't if you don't aim and try and dream then you can't make it right 100 percent, 100 percent. and you might not you know that's that's a big dream to get but if you get somewhere close to it even that would be a great achievement but i would certainly i would i would i would trust the national team and in, in your hands obviously you did mention something that needs to happen before any of that could even be discussed i think you should get your get your coaching badges done get those qualifications behind you as well and yeah, you, you never know. You never know where the world could go. But don't worry. 
to our CEO and to the rest of our employees and everybody else at Volunteering Matters. Graham, is, this is not something, there's not something happening behind the scene that we're not telling you about. He's still here. He's still going to be with us. But listen, we all have dreams. We all have dreams and it's good It's good to have. Graham, it's been, a, it's been an absolute pleasure, sir. Um, really thoroughly nice. enjoyed it. I remember when we first chatted, uh, you know, I was you know, I thought that you got a really interesting story, but I left it a while because I wanted to get to know you a little bit more, work with you, and I thought this was the right time to have the podcast. But it's been a, it's been it's been brilliant, and you've given me a lot of food for thought and thinking about a lot of stuff during it. Really, really excellent. Thanks, Kristen. Um, really enjoyed it too. Um, look forward to getting it out there. It'll, it'll be out very soon, Graham. It'll be out very soon. I'm sure. Uh, I'm sure many of our colleagues as well will enjoy watching and getting to know. Um, the story of uh, of of our, one of our directors, Mr. Mr. Robertson. But thanks again, Graham. You enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you.